It's a Mailbag Monday. We've got your questions on MLB rule changes, uh, some Braves and Twins prospects, and an update on unionization. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On MLB Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, welcome on in to Locked On MLB Prospects, your home for all things minor league baseball. I'm your host, Lindsey Crosby, baseball writer and podcaster, and thank you for making this your first listen every single day. And as we do every Monday, all of these questions come from listeners of this show. If you have a question for the mailbag, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. The show's on Twitter at Locked On Farm, or you can email us, LockedOnMLBProspects at gmail.com. Uh, Allison on Twitter asks us about... The MLB rule changes, what do we know about uh, how these rule changes affected the minor leagues in 2021 and in 2022? And I'm really glad she asked because this is something I've been asked about quite a bit by some of the other MLB hosts. So, the three big changes that were announced the other day that are coming to MLB in 2023 is a pitch clock, uh, a restriction on the shift, and larger bases. So, let's take these kind of one at a time. Uh, The pitch clock. So, what's going to happen with the pitch clock is you will now have a specific amount of time uh, when when runners are and are not on base to come, uh, as a pitcher, to come set and deliver the ball. As a hitter, you have a specific time frame with which you have to be prepared to receive uh, the pitch as a hitter, as a catcher, a certain amount of time where you have to be behind home plate in a position to receive the ball. Uh, If the batter violates it, it's a strike. If the pitcher violates it or the catcher violates it, it's a ball. Um, So the thing about the pitch clock. So number one, having watched a lot of minor league baseball games, I was against the idea of the clock until I sat through the games. So, depending on which level you are looking at, the pitch clock has lowered the length of time of the game somewhere between 17 and 30 minutes. So, for context, last year, AAA games took about 3 hours and 4 minutes. AA took about 2 hours and 57 minutes. This year... AAA is 2 hours and 43 minutes on average. So you cut out about 20, 21 minutes. AA, you cut out the 17. High A, you cut out almost 30 minutes. Whereas rookie ball did not get changed. There are no pitch clocks. It went from 3 hours and 12 minutes to 3 hours and 13 minutes. Last year, the average game at every level was either at or above 3 hours. So, here's the big thing here. It's a better experience. The things that you have cut out of the game with the pitch clock are the things that are extraneous, that that are a waste of time. You still get 27 outs. You still play nine innings. But the things you don't have now is a 30-second wait between pitches because the batter is stepping out, readjusting both of his gloves, tapping both of his shoes, fixing his helmet, getting back in the box. You don't have all of that. The batter has to stay with at least one foot in the box ready to go. Uh, You don't have pitchers who just take forever. Uh, You're cutting out extraneous stuff. And the game flows much better. We've had players on this show that have talked about this. That, especially on defense, it flows much better. You're able to get into a rhythm on defense because there's a pitch coming every 20 seconds. So, you feel good. Now, with that, there is a restriction on pickoffs. So the way the pickoff restriction works is, in essence, you can throw over or step off twice per at-bat. And that um, resets the clock. Uh, The third time that you do it, if you don't pick the guy off of first base or second base or wherever, it's a balk and everybody moves up a base. So... The big, all right, the big impact you'll see, bigger than the pitch clock, but I think the combination of the pickoff restrictions and the clock, you will see steals go up. So minor league baseball this year 
averages 1.1 steals per game on 1.4 attempts. It's about a 77% success rate. Um, In 2019, you were at about 1.11 attempts per game instead of at 1.4 where you are now. So in essence, it's one extra steal attempt every three games. The success rate has gone up as well because some guys are able to time it with the clock and with knowing you've already hit your two pickoffs and are able to get a head start. So you will see some more running. Uh, I don't necessarily know how much... I don't know how big of an impact it's going to have at the major league level. I don't think it'll have as big an impact as you saw in A-ball uh, you know, or high A because the the skill level between everybody is so much closer in MLB than it is in the minor leagues. But that will be the bigger impact of the clock. Uh, more so than anything else will be on steals. We also saw shift restrictions. Uh, there is no evidence that a shift restriction will change anything fundamentally about baseball. So uh, batting average on balls in play is a good metric to look at as far as when a guy actually hits a ball how often is it a base hit? How often is it, is it an out? So the BABIP, four different years. Here we go. 2018, 309. 2019, 305. 2021, 308. Rather consistent, right? Um, 2022, this is interesting. Uh, I have it broken down by level, and you can kind of see with the shift. Everybody had the shift restrictions in 2021 in minor league baseball. Low A. Your BABIP is 317. That's actually down from 323. Uh, High A is 307. That's down from 314. Double A is 311. That's up from 308. And then Triple A, with no shift restrictions, is at 311, which is up 0.01 from 2021. So BABIP and sometimes was up, sometimes was down from last year. Because if you think about it, guys, if you can't shift, some of those hits that would have been outs in the shift are now base hits. But conversely, some of those balls that would have beaten the shift are now outs because everybody is where they are. And that's kind of what we've heard uh, from different managers and things like that. There was a quote in a piece, it may have been a Baseball America piece, from Kevin Randell. He's manager of the AA affiliate, uh, the Pensacola Blue Wahoos for the Marlins. And he said, nothing really changed. I didn't see any advantages or disadvantages to it at all. In the end, it all kind of evened out. You steal some outs, you give up some cheap hits. I think it was pretty much all the same. And that's kind of what we saw. Uh, Now, I did also look at, they're not adding this in MLB, but the shift restriction with the pie slice, where uh, you have to be, it, it prohibits you from standing essentially behind the bag at second base. The first half, of the low A season, you did not have that rule. The shift rule was four guys on the dirt, two guys on each side of second base. Um, Batting average on balls in play was 313. In the second half, when you had the pie slice um, shift restriction, where you can't stand in essence directly behind second base because it takes a pie, like a a circular cut out of behind the, the, the bag, The second half batting average on balls in play was 307. So you actually did see an impact there. You didn't see an impact just saying you can't, you have to, you can't, you can't stand on the other side of second base. So thought that was really interesting. Thought you don't see a big, big difference on what's going to happen at the big league level next year. And then the third one is larger bases. And honestly, this is to reduce injuries. This has no measurable impact on offense. They've already had the bigger bases in the minors. Uh, It mostly helps at places like first, where you don't have a first baseman get spiked by a runner. Uh, It does not have a measurable impact. You add an inch or two between second and third, you're not increasing steals at third by 5%. It is a very negligible increase on all of that stuff. It really only exists to, to, uh, it's a little bit safer because there's a little more space between guys at the back. In just a minute, I've got some questions from Matt about specific Braves prospects, guys we didn't get to on last Friday's Farm Friday, that I think there's some genuine talent there. But first, today's episode is brought to you by our friends at LinkedIn Talent Solutions. As you gear up for fall, you need the right people on your team to help your small business fire on all cylinders. And LinkedIn Jobs 
is here to make it easier to find the people you want to talk to faster and for free. You can, you can create a free job post in minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your connections and beyond to the world's largest professional network of over 810 million people. Uh, simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. And that's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one and delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. So LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster and for free because nearly because every week, nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MLB. That's linkedin.com slash locked on MLB to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Okay, so Matt Logan on Twitter uh, was really excited that we were doing the Braves Farm Friday last week, and he had a couple prospects he was really excited to see, and then obviously I didn't get to just about any of the guys that he asked for. That's what always happens uh, because there's so many guys in every system. So a couple guys here. Uh, first one was shortstop Cal Conley. So 2021 fourth rounder by the Braves out of Texas Tech, 5'10", 185. Um, been playing shortstop. I think he's better as a second baseman than a shortstop. Uh, his arm, his range kind of profiles better at second than short. And then when you look at his offense, so decent decent contact ability. The power, there was a question as we went into the year how the power would translate from the wood bat to the metal bat. Uh, he had 35 games in low A last year after the draft, and he batted 214, 304, 307 with two home runs. So a little more question this year about what would happen. He spent two-thirds of the year in low A, one-third of the year in high A. Uh, 251, 318, 420, 16 home runs in 119 games. So uh, power's coming in better than it than it did in 2021. Uh, and so I really think the questions you have here are, one, uh, can he get to the point where he's not stretched defensively at short? Uh, does the power fully translate to the wood bat? Um, obviously, it got better. His When he went from low A to high A, and I love to see this, he jumped up a level in competition. Batting average improved by about 15 points. On base improved by about 30 points. And slugging improved by about 15. Uh, high A Rome is not a great offensive environment. Uh, you remember we talked about this last week with the with Von Grissom and Michael Harris. Um, high A Rome is not a great offensive environment. Double uh, A Mississippi is an awful offensive environment. So um, I'm glad to see the numbers ticking up despite getting into a harder place to hit. And we have to understand when he goes to Double A Mississippi, which my assumption would be next year, he would either open in high A and quickly go to double A, or he'd open straight up in double A, uh, you're going to have to be mindful of the power numbers aren't going to look great in double A because that ballpark is so massive and it's so hard to hit home runs there. But coming along has outperformed expectations. We, he's in the 20s for prospects in the system. Uh, the projection for now is still kind of a utility infield type player. He can outperform that if he can either the power can come in or he can show above average to plus defense uh, at second base. Uh, but right now we have him as a guy who's better as a utility than a starting shortstop and offensively doesn't profile well enough to be an everyday regular but can be a useful utility type for you in the big leagues. Uh, the next guy, right-hand pitcher Darius Vines. So 2019 seventh rounder out of Cal State Bakersfield. 6'1", 190, played quarterback in high school. The Braves have quite a few of those guys that were high school quarterbacks uh, that they brought in as pitchers. But uh, here's the thing. He's got very, very good control. So his stuff plays well against, against all the hitters that he faces. He spent 20 games in A this year, uh, so 107 innings. Uh, 395 ERA, 127 strikeouts to 30 walks. Um, did give up 16 home runs in Mississippi. So it's a question about how would that translate to a, to a more traditional ballpark. But kept the walks down, just about 2.5 walks per 9. Uh, struck out about 10.5 guys per 9 innings. 
So numbers you like to see there. Has gotten five, gotten into five games in AAA Gwinnett. Three starts, two relief appearances, so 21 and two-thirds innings. 2-9-1 ERA, 16 strikeouts to nine walks. Uh, the, the spike in walks, one, small sample size, two, adjustment to a new level, not as concerned. I do like the fact that he has such great control over his stuff. Um, fastball is average, maybe above average. It, t- it touches 95, but it sits around 92 or so. So velocity-wise, it's below average. Change-ups above average. Slider and curveball can each be above average. It's a question of how well can they develop. But the big thing is he can consistently throw strikes, and he's a good athlete. So there's going to be a role for him. Not sure if he's going to be a back-end starter or a long-relief guy to the pen, but I absolutely see him as a guy who does have a future at the big league level. Uh, another guy, we, we did touch on him on Friday, but Jared Schuster was on that list as well. Just quick reminder, 2020 first-rounder out of Wake Forest, 6'3", 210. A guy that has probably the best changeup in the system. They think it could be better than Ian Anderson's changeup. Uh, fastball is average. Another guy where the velocity is an issue. It sits it sits 92, touches 94. Sliders in the low 80s, and it's kind of an average pitch. Fantastic changeup. Again, fan, yeah, fantastic changeup. A uh, little more velocity on the fastball would be great, but you don't always get some of those gains out of those Wake Forest guys. Uh, went into this in more depth in the show on Friday if you want to go back and hear more about him. But I think he could be a number five or so, uh, maybe a number four. Ceiling's just limited because he doesn't have better velocity than this. Changeup is an out pitch, though, um, and, the, and the control is really good. So that gives you something you can play with. Uh, and then Jimmy Jam on YouTube, just one of the excuses to put Jimmy, the words Jimmy Jam into the podcast. Jimmy Jam on YouTube had a question about catcher Chris Williams of the Twins. Not right on any lists and just kind of an outlook for him and, and why uh, why he's not spoken of so much. So 2018 eighth rounder out of Clemson, 6'1", 225. Uh, this year, 264, 358, 545 with 27 home runs. And the question essentially here is why is he not on a, on a top 30 list if the kid's hitting almost 30 home runs in the minors? And so there's one, it's... He hasn't done a lot of things like that until this year. So he hit 15 home runs in rookie ball in 2018, 62 games. 59 home runs in, I'm sorry, uh, 10 home runs in 59 games in low A in 2019. And then lost 2020. 2021 uh, only played in about, he played in 17 high A games, the batting average of 100, no home runs. And then 28 games in double A, batted 225 with three home runs. So, lost time in 2020, and it took a while for it to come back. This year, like I said, 229, that's not right, 264, 358, 545 combined between double uh, A and triple A. 27 home runs in 102 games. That was like three fourths double A, one fourth triple A. Uh, but the thing here, and the reason why he hasn't been rated on lists, he might get rated on lists at the end of this season when some of you guys graduate. But the reason he wasn't on lists until now was uh, pull happy with high swing and miss. So 121 strikeouts this year. Plenty of walks. I mean, he drew 56 walks. So plenty of walks. The on-base percentage looks good. But um, just lots of swing and miss. And then you didn't necessarily have the track record of the home runs off of the 2021 or even the glimpse that you saw in high A in 2019. So uh, you'll have swing and miss concerns. You'll, you'll, you'll have to worry about it. If everything's being pulled, you can pitch against that. But uh, the power has come in. You do have questions about his defense as well. He's got some arm strength questions and then the ability to block. He isn't seen as the best defender. I think he should be on the top 30. I think you'll see him on top 30s to open next year as folks do re-rates in the offseason. But he's a guy that I feel like can contribute at the big league level provided his approach can be a little more consistent and a little less focused on pulling pitches for home runs. Uh, In just a minute, Jeff has a question about uh, updates for the unionization efforts by Major League Baseball Players Association right here unlocked on MLB prospects. And we're back. 
So Jeff on Twitter asked about an update on the unionization because we keep seeing things announced and uh, the president tweeted about it the other day. And so where are we right now? So Major League Baseball intends to recognize the union without going through the election process. So that's going to, one, help this happen faster because the anything the, the government does is not fast. So this will help it happen faster to do voluntary recognition and hopefully makes this a little less combative and a little less acrimonious than you've seen uh, unionization efforts in the past and across a lot of industries. So what will happen now, they have reached an agreement on a card check. So there will be an independent arbitrator who will have access to the cards, the physical cards, as well as access to official MLB um, organizational records as far as who is an active player, things like that. Uh, they will, on Wednesday, so on on the 14th, they will do that check. They will check uh, the cards versus the records to ensure that that um, only eligible players have signed cards. And then once that is done, there will still be, you know, there's a couple little like legal things you have to do. But for the most part, that is what has to get done before they can go ahead and officially form the union. Um, the big thing here is the card check is being done by a neutral arbitrator, which means that MLB does not find out who returned a card and who did not. The neutral arbitrator, arbitrator, the independent arbitrator, does it and then essentially goes to Major League Baseball and says, yes, here are the statistics. Here are the numbers. We're not giving you any names. So there's no worry about the players having to face um, repercussions or anything for joining the union. That's always a question in a card check process. Uh, Now, another thing that they have done is they have defined who the bargaining unit, unit is. And this is who is eligible to be in the minor league baseball union. So the way this works, they have decided, they have come to agreements between MLB and the Players Association. It is players at complex leagues all the way through AAA with four sets of exceptions. Exception number one, anybody on the voluntary retired list. If you have declared you are retiring, you are not part of the union. Number two, if you are on the minor league inactive list for more than two years, you haven't declared you're retiring, but you're also not playing, you have not played for at least two years, and your organization has put you on the inactive list. Number three, if you are in a league outside the United States. Um, So this is, and by this I mean the, the international players that are in the Dominican at the academies. That is who this is. If your minor league team plays in Canada, that is not, you are not, uh, you are still part of the bargaining unit. The only situation this is if you are in a league outside the United States. And the number four, if you are on a 40 man roster. Um, obviously, 26 guys, normally 28 during September, that is the active MLB roster. But the 40 man roster are people who are eligible to be promoted and called up into the big leagues. If you are on the 40-man roster, you are part of the Major League Baseball union already. So you can't be part of both unions. So they have agreed as to who is in the union. And then, so now the timeline, the idea is by the end of the weekend, this could be done. We could have a union in place, ready to go, because the card check agreement's the last uh, substantial step. There you go. And so by the end of the weekend, we could have a union both the Players Association and MLB has said that they expect to have a CBA negotiation start rather quickly, and they both intend to have it in place by spring training of 2023. So they intend to spend the winter negotiating it and have it ready to go and in place when next season starts, obviously to avoid any sort of of missed time uh, due to a, a lockout or a strike. Now, whether or not MLB actually does that, that remains to be seen, but that is what they have said. Some people have expressed concern that this means we're going to lose more minor league teams. I'll remind you, one, we lost teams in 2020 without a union, so take that for what you will. But two, when they did the reorganization in 2020, you signed 
player development licenses, and I buy you, MLB teams sign player development licenses with their affiliates. And those are good until 2030, and provided that the teams meet the minimum standards in the requ- like in the licenses, MLB teams are required to provide them with these players. So it is very difficult to contract and get rid of minor league teams until 2030 at the latest, or at the earliest. And then also, contraction of teams, which means reduction of jobs in the bargaining unit, is absolutely something that has to be collectively bargained when you have a union. So you can't just unilaterally cut teams because you have cut jobs from players that by virtue of the contract, the collectively bargained contract, they have those jobs. You cannot cut those jobs without the union agreeing to it. So everybody who's concerned that we're going to have 60 MLB or 60 minor league baseball teams next year instead of 120, I want to express to you that is not a concern Right away, as we get closer to 2030, there will be conversations about what MLB plans to do and how they negotiate it with the union. But again, it is not something they can unilaterally do when there is a union. And as I understand, there is no threat to lose significant minor league affiliations and lose minor league teams in the uh, preceding couple years. It is not going to happen because it is collectively bargained. MLB cannot do it without the union signing off on it. So it is not a concern as of right now. The player development license requires them to provide players until 2030 when those licenses renew. Great week this week. Reminder, mailbag. If you have questions for the show, I'm on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. The show's on Twitter at Locked on Farm. Or you can email us, LockedOnMLBProspects at gmail.com. Until next time, this has been Locked on MLB Prospects. Uh 